Hello, everyone. Welcome all to this session. Um, hope ever, I mean, yeah, please free to have a seat. So this session will be about um, neutron networking in private clouds and in more specifics, I mean, what we hear from us talking to customers in Europe, what are typical requirements that you see in enterprises, in larger enterprises who want to stand up OpenStack and, and what they face or what they expect from networking, what type of feature they, they expect there, right? Now, in essence, it's not going to be too different from public cloud. Huh? So there is definitely a lot of similarities of the way or what enterprises want to do with their private clouds. Um, business like departments, they want to have that agility, they want to have APIs, they want to have an isolation so that they're not doing something wrong with another application or that they're not um, doing anything with an, a neighboring department or another division. Um, and also from an owner perspective, if you look at the ones who are going to run such a cloud in a bigger enterprise, also there they're very much incentivized to keep costs low. So they're also looking at lowering, lowering the cost of servers, they're also looking at open compute projects, they're looking for um, making, I mean optimizing hypervisors at a very high level automation. So all these things, they're, they're really very much the same in enterprises, they want to adopt that same model that has been so popular in the big clouds, like from Amazon, from Google, and they're now trying to mimic that to run their own internal private cloud. You might want to ask, okay, why, if they all like so much that public cloud, why to go private? And it's all, I mean, it's not a surprise, it's all about this information protection, control, compliance that they have to go with. Now, this is all good, this is from a high level. Now, what we're really interested in, what does that boil down to on the networking, from a networking perspective? And what we're actually seeing is that, I mean, what enterprises are telling us that, I mean, one of the key differences is the type of scale that they expect in a VPC or as part of a, as part of a tenant. Because one of the, the major differences there is that applications there, they run, don't run purely in isolation. They actually communicate a lot with each other. They're not really like having one single interface to the internet. No, they're actually communicating with a lot of neighboring applications. And so what that means is that the number of subnets or the number of VMs within one tenant environment is going to be a lot and a lot higher. And this could have an impact on the number of subnets you have to support and the, t and the way how you're doing your security groups. The other thing that we are hearing is that, um, I mean, it's obviously driven by how can you sell it internally, how can you sell the proposition of a private cloud internally, is how can you support a lot of the legacy applications that are out there? Because if you're not supporting or if you're not catering for legacy applications, the real business units, they're going to be having very little incentive to actually go to this new type of private cloud. At um, the same time, there are, there are existing operational processes, there are existing environment things. I'm gonna, what I want to focus on is also, okay, what are typical things that you have to integrate with? One of the examples here I'm going to elaborate on is the way how you go or integrate with IP address management solutions. And finally, I also want to address a little bit of how can you still respect existing organizational um, rules or existing the roles of existing departments. Because essentially what you have is that, I mean, if you're standing up a new private cloud and, and, and we're all here, we're all wanting to do the new thing, but you have an, an existing corporate structure and it's not so easy to actually change that. So instead of fully changing that and instead of fully um, adopting a new culture, some of the enterprises, they actually want to see how they can map the current organization into the new way of working, right? And I'm going to give a few examples or, or I'm going to give a clue on what we are doing there um, with Nuage Networks. So that should all give you a little bit of a feeling, I mean, uh, or give you the tagline, have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. I mean, essentially, it's a, 
we all know where we are, but now we're going to go from the public cloud. Let's now see how things are running in real life. Huh? So let's start a little bit with pertinent scale. Um, and what I've drawn up here is basically what you see um, in a public cloud. If you as an enterprise, you go to Amazon, the, the first thing you pretty much do is you start up your VPC there. And then you're basically going to interface to the internet and you're going to have a certain gateway there or a router there. And you're basically having there a fully isolated networking environment. And this is pretty much how all VPCs run one next to another. Um, you have your own VLANs, your own addressing space. And then, or if you're having a public VM, you could have your floating IP to go to the outside world. And this is really the same model that OpenStack has adopted. Um, also there we have the tenants, we have external networks, external networks will have a floating IP. The VMs that need external connectivity, the floating IP will be routed on the network node to go outside to the internet. Right? Now, as I said uh, earlier, this might not be the desired way of working in your enterprise. A desired way of working may actually be that there is lots of small, uh, lots of different little bubbles, lots of different applications that each interact with each other. And as a whole, the only separation that really is necessary is to separate between life cycle phases or to really separate between business domains, right? So you might have developer QA and production or you might have business unit one, two, and three. But inside, everything could be still open. Inside, every Inside, you actually want to make use of, the, of a kind of a distributed routing process or you want to make communication as good and as automated as possible. But there is no real necessity here to really give different VPCs or really give different um, routers, so to speak, to every one of those applications. The other thing what is quite different also is um, it's not like you have overlapping IP space typically in enterprises, you could have, but typically you have an IP system that you really want to know this host, I can address them with that particular IP address, that particular host name. So whether they're deployed in dev, QA or production, you'd always want to have a single pointer to reach a specific VM. And also because of what I was saying earlier, because of you have these bigger bubbles here, you're ending up with a, high, a much higher scale immediately. So Numbers that we have seen is actually here having to support ten, tens of thousands of VMs here and over a thousand subnets as well. It's not like the, the 10 server setup, obviously. I mean, the phases or, or if you really want to make a step to private cloud, you typically start off with about 50, 100 hypervisors and you grow from there, right? But this is like the number that from a networking point of view, um, that we're seeing that have to be, that it has to scale to, right? The other thing that you see here is that every bubble here has basically two external connections, right? And I'm going to develop a little bit on that. Um, how do you go to the internet from each one of those bigger application, I mean, these bigger life cycles? Or how do you go to a management or a shared network? So when we started off with that and we went to the discussion, um, with some enterprises. I mean, we actually, first thing was to, to investigate if floating IP could be used or reused in some shape or form, right? Now, the thing is, if you're having your little application modeled as a tenant, as a project, and you deploy routers in there, um, and you want to go out, this is where you would then use your floating IP. Now, the thing is, if you have a lot and lots of those applications, you, you may wonder, okay, what is then the sense of a floating IP? What is the real meaning of a floating IP? It would be really something artificial that you're bringing into the discussion to make it work, right? I mean, and that's a, I mean, that actually doesn't feel right if you have to introduce a new IP or introduce a new networking routing to communicate between tenants. Um, the other thing is that floating IPs, I mean, from an optimization perspective, you're effectively always going through this bottleneck of the network node. And you could think, okay, I mean, that's definitely the case with Icehouse. You might think that's resolved in Juno, but what we have to realize is that in, 
if you grow your data centers at a bigger scale, you typically don't have layer two fabrics and you can't really go out at every hypervisor with a specific floating IP. So essentially you would still have to go to this one network node where you can expose your public IP, which is in a different range than your server or your hypervisor address. And then lastly, also there is some limitations around multiple floating IP subnets. So essentially when you're going, growing bigger, you wanna have or wanna use more and more floating IP subnets. It's not so trivial actually here to set up as well. So we were looking further and so we thought about, okay, let's, let's use shared networks. Shared networks is on the other side of things. Shared networks, I mean, you can attach VMs here from every tenant to a shared network and that's the whole idea then they can communicate um, between each other. Now, obviously what you then see is that, um, okay, how to do the routing between different shared networks. You kind of have to deploy a separate router at another tenant that is not visible then to your tenant himself because you would only want to have them um, hang the VMs onto that subnet. But the biggest problem is actually that you have shared networks that are visible to each and every tenant, right? There is no way how you can map a shared network to only specific tenants. They're effectively exposed to everyone. And what you then have is basically to, I mean, um, how do you then even scale up to the high number of VMs if all the VMs need to talk to each other? So the way how we want, I mean, we in the end address such type of use cases with Nuage is actually to have a routable domain, a router per life cycle. And within such a routing context, by default, all VMs or all subnets can talk to each other, right? What you can then do is to make a hierarchy in this router context. And the hierarchy would then be to on a per tenant level, on a per project level, and you map the subnets within the project that you want to expose them in. So essentially here in the example, you see for instance, the, the router that is responsible for routing between all developer instances will have a number of subnets and you can then map the subnets to a specific tenant. The idea is then that the developers or the, the members of this tenant then only see those subnets and they can only deploy the VMs in those subnets. And the same applies to other tenants. If some of these instances want to talk to each other, they can. They just go via our router instance. And that routing instance, I mean, we're always implementing it in a distributed way. Um, essentially, you will actually have an overlay tunnel, a VXLAN tunnel that goes from your hypervisor that hosts the VM for tenant Y that goes to the VM on tenant X. Now, it also solves another thing. Um, if we have this, this distributed routing, the way how you can connect them to the management networks, the shared networks and the public internets is actually by peering or by um, advertising the routes or by static routes, I mean, whatever you prefer in your environment, to actually say, hey, to wanna, if you wanna reach subnets, everything for this developer instance, you can first have to go here to the new distributed routing, and then he will sort it out to go further up to the tenants or the other way around. Every subnet that is being created for a particular tenant gets automatically advertised into the other side, right? Now, sometimes people still wanna have certain isolation between tenants. I mean, that is actually quite, I mean, that brings me here to security groups. So if you do wanna implement certain um, policies that say, what projects or what tenants can talk to each other, which ones cannot talk to each other, or what hosts within a subnet cannot talk to another host, then you typically go to security groups. And that's also the, the, the way how, what is possible today with OpenStack. Um, and it's a, it's a way of really, it's a vPort oriented way. It's very much what you do with, open, with uh, Amazon, what you do with OpenStack. And you basically can define there, hey, those machines, those vPorts, they're all like Windows machines and they can talk with Active Directory servers. Or you could say those web machines can talk to application machines. And that's actually the, the normal way that is very useful if you wanna 
set security rules within your tenant environment as a user itself. Now, there is also the other set of requirements where you have more as a from a global perspective. If you want to say, hey, tenants cannot, cannot talk to each other, projects cannot communicate with each other, or you want to do it on a subnet to subnet basis, that's actually another way. And that's actually where we also see a lot of requirements from enterprises, um, what they're looking for. So here it's like very easy, or, or what you see in, uh, in OpenStack security groups, this is actually a model that they also would like to, to see. Right. So with that, this is more or less what I wanted to talk a bit about scale. You see it's instead of having very uh, smaller application that each work independently, actually in enterprises we see a lot of the need for having bigger domains or bigger environments where VMs and applications can talk to each other. And so as such, your distributed routing or your network topology should be able to cater that much bigger scope or much bigger range of um, VMs and subnets. The second case was all about supporting legacy applications. And legacy applications, I mean, I have three, um, and it's all to do with convincing the business units to make use of this new private cloud. How do you do that? I mean, are you going to say, no, you have to start from scratch and you have to redevelop all your new applications? You start with Docker and all of that, or are you going to give them a hand? And so essentially here, what I'm gonna list out are three things that we think, okay, with some easy help on the network side, we can convince business units to actually adopt an OpenStack cloud paradigm. And the first one is, um, applications that are only validated or only supported, for instance, on VMware. I'm not saying it's only on VMware, you have other things, but it's a typical thing like there are certain applications that are only validated on a particular hypervisor. And so where you what you then get is a heterogeneous environment where you basically want to have networking that can span multiple server groups that each have their own underlying hypervisor. A second group would be how to support multicast applications. Multicast is probably something more from the past. It's probably something that you don't see so much anymore in the new types of applications where you have everything nice unicasted. But the reality is that there are quite a few uh, web, I mean, application um, frontends or application um, backends that are still using multicast for internal synchronization, or you have the, the video broadcast that have to be distributed. So for those things, you actually would need a solution that can send and receive layer three multicast and makes as good as possible use of your fabric and your overlay structure. And the last one is around um, voice and storage applications. And typically voice applications, they are, I mean, they want to be first class citizens. They want to be prioritized a little bit more. And so for voice applications, you typically see requirements coming back around, okay, we want to make sure the quality of service is set correctly um, with either a trust of whatever the application has set or either an override, or we want to make sure the other guys are well behaving in the network. So there you end up with rate limits. And lastly, for storage applications, you typically, I mean, suppose you have a newer application that uses object storage, right? Instead of trying to access Swift through a network node or instead of really going through a gateway to, to reach that common Swift backend, there are actually options or, or they're looking how we can do a local breakout from the hypervisor to immediately get the object um, from the backend and pass it on onto the VM, right? So with all those things you see, there are legacy applications and there are a set of network goodies that are coming as a result out of that to um, support that. Um, case three is around how to integrate in existing environments. And 
there is a lot of different systems to integrate with. Um, could be OSS, could be, I mean, but here the focus is on IP address management. An IPAM system typically consists of DHCP and DNS and a lot of nice analytics tools on top of that as well. But essentially, the current environment is that all the servers, they send out their DHCP, DHCP gets relayed in the fabric, reaches the DHCP server, DHCP server does the IP address allocation, gives some special options through to the fabric back, but also does immediately the DNS registration, so that later on that host can always be identified IP to host, right? Now, this is what enterprises are used to. So, they have also all the operational tools around lease management and all these things to operate that very well and, and they're quite hooked on to that. So let's have a look how we can, what we can do from an OpenStack perspective. So with OpenStack, today is like, if you want to start up a VM, your DHCP agent is actually going to give the IP address. The address allocation itself is actually not done here by the running DNS mask process but it's actually done here in the OpenStack Neutron framework, right? So it's not something, what essentially happens is every time you start up a VM, during the scheduling process, your IP address is allocated and is then provisioned into DNS mask. And when later on that VM boots up, it's gonna go to DNS mask to retrieve it. There is at this moment, I mean, no core project that really handles uh, DNS registration. There is an incubation around designate, I mean, and so that would provide a, heap, a, a huge step forward. Um, but at the moment, it is where it is, right? So how can we make the two things work together? So this is my normal infrastructure with the DHCP and DNS. And it could be as simple actually as deploying a DHCP relay. The HTTP relay is already something that is available in DNS mask. It's not something, it's just a matter of configuring it correctly. And so what you, what is then needed is effectively a synchronization between your IPAM system and Neutron about what subnets are to be made available in OpenStack or what subnets are being used from IPAM, right? So synchronization on the subnet pools. Then there is a synchronization on the IP address allocation Right, and so typically this one would still select the IP address, but would actually give this address back to Neutron. At that moment, this guy knows very well what IP address will be used for a VM. And so when that VM finally start up, starts up, the DHCP relay agent can actually retrieve it back from the DHCP server. So it's just a few simple tweaks, but it could make a huge difference in like making more and at more and more acceptable in an enterprise environment, right? There is also a, an optimization to that. Instead of, I mean, especially with uh, with Juno, I mean, I think that's going to be even better. I mean, instead of having the DNS mask and do, doing the DHCP relay here, you might as well put it here, and then at that moment you you have a fully kind of distributed DHCP relay agent that um, takes out any DHCP discovered from here sends it out over unicast to the DHCP, and then it's another step that you actually have distributed, right? Let's see what time is. So, last case is around roles of existing departments. Um, and I, wa I just wanted to, like, it's, there is no rocket, or there, there's no rocket science on what is the correct answer here. But the reality here is that from a top level point of view, people want to deploy faster and faster their applications. And it doesn't matter at what cost sometimes. I mean, it's like what the guy from BMW said yesterday during the, his keynote, it's all about doing things fast, fast, fast. Now, from, this is a top, top level directive. But then it comes like, okay, how do we fit it in with existing change processes, with existing groups and responsibilities, but each one has its role to play. And so you have these 
you have the apps people, you have network people, security people. Um, what we see, for instance, is that, I mean, one particular case that was about um, network, they were the only ones who could assign subnet ranges, security, these were the ones administrating users and permissions, and the ones setting ACLs, and then compute are then the ones who are actually controlling what VM goes where, right? Now, when going with, with a nice OpenStack cloud, you can actually get away with all of that. You can go much faster. The question is if you want to go immediately with this revolution or if there is something in the middle here that we can make a, a more evolutionary path. So when looking at OpenStack, what you actually can do there is you can today create nice member roles in Keystone. Right? So you can specify or can define multiple roles you have to then manipulate some of the policy files to restrict what every role can do. But it actually works quite nice because you can work it at a very granular level, almost up to the API level, so to speak, create router and stuff. Um, you can say, hey, only this role or only this guy can do this. And then you just have to select your members to the role. So we can actually mimic that whole organization. We can map it into OpenStack if we want to. The problem is when we do that, is that you're effectively still creating that or you're still maintaining the same chain of activities. You would still have a security guy, still having a network guy who has to say, yes, I'm all right with that. And only then the, the guy deploying the VM can get into action, right? So this is what we perceive or what we see as a status quo. What we have done in Nuage is actually try to make a kind of a cookie cutter approach. And the cookie cutter approach is where you can actually do templated designs. And in a such, as part of a template, you can make one project a template or one whole ap lifecycle application. You can put it all in a template. And depending on the environment, sometimes you want to include subnet definitions as part of that or exclude subnet definitions or include ACLs or exclude them. I mean, it depends a bit how the organization essentially works internally. But effectively, the outcome is that you get a template that has been approved by security that has the networking guys are happy with, and that is good to go for the application guys to start up with their application deployment. It doesn't matter how small their si or deployment is, how big they want to create it, if they want to maybe add more own subnets or not. When, once you have defined that cookie, they can actually color it themselves and make it their own nice application out of. So with that, um, I want to thank you for your time. I think um, what I try to bring here is just a number of small items that we think they could be nice additions to the way how OpenStack works. And it's also kind of a common call to action here. It's like, let's actually work together on getting some of those things actually into OpenStack so we can all bring this up to a level that we can adoption even faster and better in uh, private environments. Thank you for your time. Do you guys have any questions? Could you back up to that last slide? This one? Do you want to see how they've colored in? <laughs> Oh, how they work? Yeah, so. Okay, so you can actually, um, your template you would put in a certain, I mean, you can choose how much network specifics you can put in, but you start at the router level, so you can have a routable domain. You can um, already add certain security zones, so you would say, hey, in this router, I would have a DMZ zone, a web zone, or you would have an, a, a DB zone in the back. You can then attach security rules to those zones. So you can say, hey, web zone can talk to application zones over these type of ports. These are the quality of service parameters you want to apply to whatever subnets that have been attached to it. And this is what you could give as a package to, or you, I mean, we call it instance. This is what you instantiate and give to an application guy. The application owner, 
he can then um, add its own subnets. So he can do a little bit of own network management if he wants to, right? Or you can do it yourself as an administrator before him. I mean, it depends there a bit. Um, but essentially, what I said was everything the template in, the security zones, the ACLs, um, also, by the way, the permissions, who can deploy in what zone, are all part of that template. And so what that means is once that instance is given, it doesn't mean that everyone can just deploy as before in that temp or in that instance. No, they're actually subject to the rules and the permissions or to the rules and their um, well, provided permissions that they've, they've given the job to. If you want to get some more, exp I mean, really see it. Sounds like a policy model. It is a policy model, yes, absolutely. I mean, there's different words for it. We started off with templates and then now all of a sudden policy became like a nice word last, I mean, beginning of the year. So it's policy-based networking, absolutely. If you want to have a look, feel free to come to the booth and then okay. to see it for yourself. Any other question? No? Thanks, all.